any of you who are veterans out there probably already know how infuriating the VA can be to deal with. It seems that the agency specializes in long wait times and broken promises. But can you imagine what it would have been like to get home from a major war only to find that there was no system in place at all to get you the care you needed and only a vague, maybe someday promise of some financial aid from whew, the government? Well, times were a lot different following World War I. I mean, the empty and broken promises thing was still pretty on par, but back then, most people still had a fair bit of trust in the government. The 24-hour news cycle didn't exist, and neither did the internet or social media. The government hadn't assassinated Kennedy yet. Yeah, I said it. There was no Waco, no Ruby Ridge, and the alphabet agencies were seemingly better at keeping secrets, so it was harder to come by evidence of the government being a malignant tumor. For many, that faith would wither and die. And I don't mean like today, I mean even back then. Looking back at history as much as I have lately, today's story is probably one of the most significant moments where our government tarnished its image in the eyes of the people. Could this have been the point where patriotism began to swirl down the drain? It's hard to tell as the story has now been lost in public consciousness, but I'll let you be the judge. This story is the fight for veterans' rights that would come to be commonly known as the Bonus Army. But before I get into the meat and potatoes here, this video is brought to you by Blackout Coffee Company. Unlike the government cronies in today's tale, Blackout Coffee is a firm supporter of veterans, soldiers overseas, and your rights. Every purchase on their site through my link helps support my channel, and every purchase of their partner roasts helps to support some of your favorite gun rights groups. They are honestly some of my favorite coffee, and everything is roasted fresh to order, so only the best coffee shows up at your door. So to check them out and help support the channel, go to blackoutcoffee.com slash libertydoll. The practice of wartime bonuses was not a new one at the time. The history is murky, but it seems it was put into place here in the United States in 1776 and had its origins from English legislation passed way back in 1592 to 1593 that provided medical care and maintenance for disabled veterans and bonuses for soldiers. This was recognition for soldiers who had done the country a service, what most people saw as a duty, and the idea was to provide medical care for the wounded and to compensate soldiers for the difference in wages they could have earned had they been working their normal jobs back home. Basically, the bonuses were meant to take care of the people who had literally risked their lives for whatever government cause or conflict. It makes sense. But then, in 1917 and 1918, the Woodrow administration bumped up government salaries to offset inflation. But this didn't include soldiers' pay, and vets organized to try and get it applied to them as well. Opponents called this a bonus rather than compensation, and the bill died in 1921, was vetoed again in 1922, and was vetoed again in 1924. Thank you for your service. Congress overrode this veto, but added some fine print. This fine print gave veterans credits instead of money, based on time spent in the U.S. versus overseas, and put a cap on it. Anyone with $50 or less in credits could collect immediately, but anyone over that threshold would have to wait until 1945. But back then, service was still seen as a patriotic duty, and they thought that there was no way that the government would go back on what was owed them, so most of the vets just shrugged their shoulders and thought, well, you know what? I survived the war to end all wars, I have work, and I can wait 20 years, it's no big deal. But then, then a nationwide depression began that got so bad, so quick, it became known as the Great Depression. The country was hit from both sides when poor farming techniques over massive swaths of land, years of drought, and insect invasion led to horrible crop yields in the farmlands, along with a simultaneous stock crash of 1929 fueled by awful interest rates and rampant inflation. These were just a few of the many, many reasons that culminated into the perfect storm that kicked the depression in so fast and so hard that people found themselves out of jobs and often out of their homes virtually overnight. We've heard about it. We know it was bad. 
So now here are these grizzled war vets, out of work, some out of homes, most with families to care for, no food, no shelter, and no medical care. Sounds great. So a lot of them thought, well, yeah, wait a minute. I have all of these bonuses promised to me from the government. They owe me back pay. Why don't I just get them to pay out a little early? I did answer my country's call and risk my life after all, and now I'm at risk of losing my home, my family, and my life. I mean, valid reasoning. It was a sentiment that spread like wildfire as New Hope always does to those who have been losing everything and are now being crushed with their responsibilities. This is where it gets kind of complicated. The recorded facts vary significantly, so I'm just going to lay it out with the highs and lows of the figures. The truth is, this story is awful even if the numbers of those affected were a fraction of the lowest recorded figures. So I would say that this story really starts to catch steam on May 17th, 1932, when about 400 impoverished veterans led by a former Sergeant Walter Waters used a train loaned by sympathetic railroad officials to start the trek to Iowa from Portland. From there, they would hitch rides and just walk when needed the rest of the way down to Washington, picking up more and more vets along the way. Because who doesn't love a good train hopping when times are tough? gaunt and grizzled, some with families in tow, tens of thousands of impoverished World War I veterans arrived in Washington during the summer of 1932. The beleaguered, broke, and starving bonus army had arrived. In just a few days, shanty towns grew up in many locations in Washington. The three main ones were at 12th Street and B Street Northwest, now called Constitution Ave, 3rd and Pennsylvania Ave Northwest, and the largest by far was at Anacostia Flats and covered 30 acres. The overall numbers of protesters vary greatly depending on the source, but are estimated to have peaked at around 43,000, with most of that being veterans and their families, but also including sympathetic public in their support. The vets themselves ranged from 10,000 on the low end to more than 25,000, but most sources agree it was probably around 17,000 plus and minus a few. Basically, there were more than enough that if it happened today, the White House would be putting up fences and Congress would be squawking about an insurrection. They basically just made a lot of noise around the Capitol, trying to get the attention of those in power and seek aid. And of course, they were largely ignored by the ruling elite because A, they were just a bunch of normal citizens without money to put in politicians' pockets, and B, even worse, they were asking government to actually hold up its end of the bargain. Who does that? At one point, the White House offered the crowd $10,000 to pack up and go, which was nothing compared to what was actually owed. Some took the money and left, but most of them stayed. Some folks at least had a little bit of sympathy. One significant person was a former Brigadier General, Pelham Glassford. He was the DC police superintendent, and on June 1st, he asked Congress for $75,000 to help feed the marchers and their families, but Congress refused. A couple weeks later, the House of Representatives voted to give the vets their bonuses early, but it didn't pass, and President Hoover promised to veto the bill had it passed anyway. So, the largely peaceful protests, and ironically, they were actually peaceful, not the way the media described peaceful protests when it was Antifa burning down buildings and looting. They went on for weeks, until July 28th of that year. That was the day government trust took a massive blow that would only slightly recover with the solidarity that followed the bombing of Pearl Harbor years later. For some reason, as government is apt to do, the Hoover administration decided to shit all over the First Amendment. Now that kind of thing is par for the course these days, but back then, it was a big deal. They sent Generals MacArthur and Patton with about 800 infantry and cavalry and 2,700 troops in reserve to push the bonus army of starving vets and their families out of Washington. On this day, citizens would see American troops, machine guns, and tanks roll down the streets of Washington in force against American veterans, women, and children. I'm going to just take a second here to let that sink the f in. While most of the Bonus Army were unarmed, they were veterans who had fought in the largest war the world had ever seen, and they were not going to just 
take that crap from their own government lightly. The army was forced to use tear gas and bayonets to oust the resistant veterans. They set fire to the shanty homes as they went, and what few relics of the veterans' lives the families had managed to salvage were lost in the flames. So yes, my dear viewers, it is entirely possible for a presidential administration to turn the troops against American citizens. At one point, General Patton, in his tank, recognized a man among the crowd he was forcing down the street. His name was Joe Angelo, and he had saved Patton's life in World War I. Still, his tanks crushed the entire camp. The vets fled across the river, and Hoover finally ordered the attacks to stop. But General MacArthur reportedly decided the vets were nothing more than communist agitators looking to overthrow the government, which sounds familiar, and continued the operation. Despite the massive number of minor injuries that occurred, the vets were pretty restrained with the presence of their families. Reports show that in all of this chaos, there were only two fatalities. A vet named William Hashka was caught up in police fire near the Capitol, and details are almost non-existent as to how and why he got shot. The second was a baby when, unfortunately, its mother, a veteran's wife, miscarried during the attack. Many civilians were caught up in the violence, and at one point, one of the civilians and a resident of Washington was heard to repeatedly shout, the American flag means nothing to me after this day. MacArthur himself threatened to arrest him. After that day, most would leave the Capitol, presumably going home or to wherever they thought they could start their lives over, which was a pretty common theme during the Great Depression. The national response was a real mixed bag of nuts and largely depended on the overall view people had of the government. A sizable part of the nation would never trust the government again, and the local newspapers reflected that. On July 29th in Las Vegas, Vice President Curtis was even heckled off stage. It also didn't look great for Hoover's re-election campaign and might have helped him lose to FDR. Of course, FDR was also terrible, just in different ways. Well, actually, there were a couple similar ways, but we'll get to that in a moment. The blame game also saw new heights. General Glassford, who had largely supported the vets, denied passing orders to the military troops to clear the protesters and blamed the government for the violence and trouble. The Bonus Army organized again in 1933. Roosevelt still didn't pay them, but he fed them, at least, and set up a camp for them. And when a bill worked its way through Congress in 1936 to free up their money and pay them, he vetoed it but Congress gave him the finger and overrode that veto. So, four years after the first bonus army, the vets finally got their bonuses. The vets received more than $2 billion in payout, which really puts that original $10,000 offer into perspective. And seeing the light at least a bit, in 1944, during World War II, Congress passed the GI Bill. In the end, the veterans got their due, but unfortunately, they had to fight their own country and military to get it. That is it for this video, guys. I hope that you liked this delve back into the history videos. I definitely had fun with it and learned a lot. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe if you are new here. Ring that notification bell if you want to get updated on my regular videos in the history videos like this. And as always, guys, thanks for tuning in and happy shooting.